Welcome to the Mental Advantage Podcast. Whether you're an athlete trying to perform at your best when it counts the most, a coach or business leader trying to get more out of your team, or someone looking for more personal growth, this is the place for you. This podcast is your map to guide you to the right mindset, systems, and strategies you need to become the best version of yourself. And now, here's John Cullen and Brandon Allen. All right, welcome into the Mental Advantage podcast. I am happy that uh, we're back, Brandon. We took a couple of weeks off there, uh, had some vacations and different things going on, but it's uh, good to see you. It's good to be back on the show. We got a couple of good ones tonight, huh? We do, and uh, it's always good um, to have friends of the show back on, and so um, was Zach and Sean, and it, uh, it's a good show. Absolutely. So Zach Cohen, uh, who's the founder of Acme Mental Performance and Sean O'Neill, the founder of One Mental Performance, uh, are joining us. Uh, Sean was episode 11. Zach was a little later in episode 73. Uh And, um, you know, it's it's funny. I was thinking about this today. It was good that this show kind of started really focused a lot on that mental performance side. We still talk a lot about it, but it's evolved over time and we're you know, kind Uh of branching out and having just a totality of the kind of mental side, performance side of things where, um, you know, whether it's mindfulness, whether it's just dealing with adversity in life in general, whether it's, you know, teaching resilience or talking about character like we did with General Castlin and with uh, Dr. Matthews, Uh Um, all of these things kind of just, you know, interweave like we've talked about before. So it's nice to get back to the roots a little bit tonight and uh and talk about mental performance with Sean and Zach and who are still on the you know working with athletes on a daily basis, weekly basis, whatever the case would be, and just mm-hmm. learning uh about some of those pain points, some of the challenges they're facing. Uh for sure. And and it's it's interesting too, you know, it's 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 definitely something that um as I think we all do, there's this evolution, the growth of of um, both as a practitioner of the mental performance side of things and and um, to hear kind of where the guys, uh, we know where they were, the listeners know yeah. where they were. Um, there's been enough time to kind of see how they've evolved. Um, they've picked up some additional clients. They've started to implement some new techniques and learn some new um, areas of, of um, study. So I think um, I think it's a it's a really interesting show and, um, you know, uh, listeners should enjoy it. That's a great point. And we talk a lot about that process and the evolution of it um, real quickly, Brandon, before we uh, get to the, the main event here. Why don't you yeah. tell the folks about the uh, MindView promo? Yeah, program? I mean, yeah. Thanks, John. So, I mean, certainly you talk about evolution and, and we can all um, all better ourselves. Right. So. Um, for all the listeners, uh, we still have the MindView promo code. It's going to be an ongoing thing. Um, would highly uh, encourage you to take that. Um, it's about a 15-minute test. Captures all the key mindset skills like grit and resilience, hope, self-control, motivation. You know, we mentioned it before. You and I took it. Um, it, it, was, it was a really, really beneficial thing. For me, and then I've tried to um, implement some of the the uh, skills that that they've put forth and some of the uh, information that they allow you to kind of polish on. Um, so it was it was really good. And so for the listeners, just enter MA twenty. So um, like mental advantage twenty MA twenty in the promo code box at checkout, and you'll get twenty percent off um, of the package. So. Fantastic. Yeah, it's a really, to Brandon's point, it's a really good thing. And you can find that at www.mindview, that's V-U-E dot com and um, all kinds of different packages that you can participate in there as well. Speaking of mindsets, Brandon, uh, I can't wait uh, for the listeners to hear tonight's show with Zach and with, with Sean, but also in two weeks, we have a guest that's coming on, Damon West, um, who 
just do yourself a favor as a listener, go Google Damon West, go look on YouTube and Google Damon West. He is got, I've been reading this book of his, the change agent um, and preparations for that show. And I, I can't tell you the last time that I have been so consumed with a book. I mean, you know, we were college roommates. That's not like me to just be consumed with books. Uh, lots right. of times I would come home and uh, back to the apartment and be like, Hey, uh, what do you got planned? And you're like, um, studying for that test we have tomorrow. And be like, what's that again? Uh, what test is that? <laughs> so, <laughs> so the listeners are like, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, but, uh, the, the point being every single, I mean, I've taken this to bed and been reading it in bed. I've been reading it when I wake up in the morning. It's an unbelievable story about, you know, here he is. He's a former college quarterback sentenced to life in prison and just really transformed his world. And the, Absolutely. The strategies, the the tactics, all of the things that you're going to learn from him. And what's unique about it, though, is the teachers, the people who were placed by God, in my opinion, for him in some of the most unforeseen places, uh, mm-hmm. which was prison. But just the people he learned from and the the wisdom that they imparted on him. It's just a really, I, I absolutely can't wait uh, for that conversation for the listeners to hear from Damon. But in the meantime, uh, get your pen and paper ready because we have Sean O'Neill and Zach Cohen. Well, as you heard there from the introduction, uh, we've got Zach Cohen and Sean O'Neill with us this evening. Um, both, of course, are return guests to the show. Um, and I always have to mention the the footnote to Sean is that he is the one and only guest host that we've ever had on the show. So, Sean, I don't know if that is good or bad that we've never done that again. So I don't know if you just set the bar so high that we were like, that's, there's no topping that, or we were like, yeah, that, that, you know, I don't know if that was a good idea. I, I'm ready to <laughs> jump back and redeem myself anytime you need me to. <laughs> yes. I actually, it's funny because I actually have reached out to Sean a couple of different times when, uh, we were, I think there was one other time. It hasn't happened many times because Brandon and I usually keep, make sure that we at least are scared. We, for all of the shortcomings, we can at least make sure that we're on the same page as what day we're going to record. Uh, and, but there was, I think another time that we were like, Hey, would you be able to do it? And then when you were like, no, I, I won't be able to, we just said, okay, we're just not going to do a show that week. So right, next but, time we'll just call Zach. Uh, yeah, exactly. I'm the yeah. podcast. I'm ready to hop in when needed. That's right. <laughs> yes, that's exactly. You're the Joan Rivers, Sean, of, uh, <laughs> of of our show. So, well, no, welcome, guys. We can't we can't thank you guys enough for joining us again. I've been looking forward to this conversation all day, um, and and really just you know for the listeners. I mean, because Sean, you were episode eleven, as I mentioned. That's a quite a while ago as we're coming up on this will be episode 96 so what's been happening what what has been going on in your life with one mental performance so i'm still teaching high school absolutely loving it um but i have jumped more into the mental performance side um i've picked up some more athletes um in different sports including division one volleyball um one of my first clients is getting ready they're about to be uh starting the college rule series so that's really awesome. really cool um we've been talking a lot about gratitude and enjoying the experience but stop the gratitude as soon as you get the uniform on so that's been a little bit of new navigation um i got a training instructor in mindful sport mindful sports performance enhancement um so i've been diving a lot into mindfulness and how it works with athletes um game changer absolute game changer um that program they have a really good elaborate process um it was two days via zoom and it was i was definitely the dumbest person in the room um <laughs> and and there there was some there was some a really, really impressive group and tremendous learning experience. So I've been starting to incorporate that more with my athletes as well. That sounds right up Brandon's alley. He's all about that mindfulness and uh, I could see him. And if you you ever want to not be the dumbest in the room, 
Shoot Come on our head. podcast. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I was, I was, wait, I figured that was coming. It was either going to be me saying it or Brandon saying it, but because we can definitely fix that ratio really quickly. Oh, we, uh, can, we can dumb some stuff up in our hurry. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, Zach, what about you? What's been happening with Acme Mental Performance? Yeah, so I've, um, like Sean, I've been adding a couple of uh, different clients over the past a couple of months. Um, everything got, ever since I started kind of about a year ago or more, I can't even remember the exact time frame at this point, which is great um, that I've kind of been open and trying to help as many athletes as I can from kind of the youth ranks up through college. Um, still looking to kind of break into the college ranks a little bit and kind of help that um, higher elite level athlete kind of reach their next level. But um, what's been really um, helpful to me and I'm grateful for is that I've been able to help a lot of younger kids, even down to about 10 and 11, um, which I think is pretty early sometimes for some parents to jump into the world of mental performance and kind of acknowledge that it could help their child and see that, you know, maybe it's just frustration, anxiety and stress and different things um, and see if this might add to um their abilities because it might be difficult at times for them to understand some of the concepts that we then talk about. Um, but I've worked with kids from both male and female um, and now hockey. Um, a kid I was just recently working with actually went to Austria to play um, in a small tournament that they had there. Um, softball, still with a, um, a player that has been traveling with a softball team and actually just managed to make her high school team but she's in her last year of middle school so she's kind of the second kid i think that the regime that's been coaching at her high school to take a kid from the middle school and put them on the high school team before she's even in high school um uh, tennis golf i recently just had a um, discussion in a workshop with a uh, travel golf team and a lot of it actually to sean's point um was on mindfulness um, and kind of the information that I've gathered and learned thus far. And I thought that was a huge piece of helping them understand how important it is to be mindful on the golf course. I think especially as an individual sport and kind of what that means and how it can best help. Um, and then also volleyball and basketball. And some of these kids are multi-sport, multi-sport athletes, excuse me, which always helps them to um, see where they can add the different mental techniques that we talk about into everything that they're doing. Um, so that's kind of where I've been at. I'm still working on opening myself up to anything and everything, including the possibility of working with a music school um, upcoming. Mm -hmm. So kind of doing something different on that side, because that too, of course, is a performance. So it doesn't all have to be sports. Um, so that's kind of a different avenue for me, um, as well as still on that youth rank side. Um, but um, that's going to be kind of interesting and exciting um, for me to jump into and see how that can uh, help them. That's awesome. So, so two. I guess this is maybe a two part question. Um, you know, both of you, Sean, you mentioned about having a, a a client who is who has been with you long enough now that they're reaching certain levels. And and Zach, you're kind of you know you're going to get there. Do you find it difficult though, as a as a mental performance coach, to kind of be patient because? I don't, it feels like you do have to kind of grow with your client. Um, I guess that would be the first part of that question. And then the, the, I guess the, for both of you, uh, this part too, um, when you have a multi-sport athlete, do, do you find it challenging? Like, do you have to is everything geared towards just the individual or do you start kind of hearing certain lessons and certain um, mindfulness towards a sports specific piece? Um, that's probably a lot to try to dissect. So um, for me, I've been working with this young man for two years almost. Um, and the very first question he asked me and how we actually met was he overheard me talking to someone at a Hamptons college league game. And he looked me up on Twitter and he was just like, I, I get so nervous. I get so anxious. Um, and his first question to me was, um, how do you stop 
your heart from beating out of your chest when you're playing in front of like 200 people. And now he's getting ready for the college world series. So (laughs) he's going to have a lot more than 200 people. Um, But he, he will say like, it's like, man, I look back at me last year because we journal and we talk about our journals and he's, He's like, I don't even remember that kid. He's like, it's kind of cute <laughs> what that kid was like and now where I am now. So, um, and it hasn't been all highs. There's been a lot of lows, um, which is baseball. So, um, helping him work through that has been, has been really good. And then, he, um, then his sister joined in. She's a, a division one volleyball player. Um, and she gave me a total new insight into working with the sport that I wasn't really too familiar with. Um, but I think a lot of the skill sets that we teach translate all sports. I yeah. think the language that we use with specific sports might kind of hook them a little bit more. But once we start having just general conversations where it, they're not necessarily sports related anymore, they're, they're skill set development. Zach? Yeah. And for me, I think it's kind of been similar. So you're kind of the first part was about kind of that patience piece of it or, or how the growth goes within the business side. For me, I've had to um, work on my own patience. And I think that's helpful because if I can exhibit some kind of patience for myself and what I'm doing, I'm able to talk more effectively about that when it matters for an athlete that I'm working on, working with. Um, but in terms of reaching to those other levels of some of the athletes that I not necessarily have made um, the headway with, obviously, I think some of the athletes that I've been working with now, if the relationship has been built strong enough, that they will be at that next level eventually, right? And they might be around to continue working with me in the future, even if there's a year or two or more breaks into what they're doing, right? Because I'm still available to them. Um, so that might bring me to that point. Or as the word of mouth goes on, or as I continue to reach out to other um, organizations and athletes and find ways either through social media and other means of meeting athletes where they're at and getting the word out about how helpful mental performance can be is breaking down those barriers and those stigmas about it, right? That actually it's a tool for them. And another thing that can be used, um, like in the golf example, right? It's another kind of um, thing in their bag, right? It's, it's another club that most aren't using. It's not a physical club you can hold, but it's definitely there and definitely be very useful. Um, so it's making those organizations even down to the youth level as the coaches and or presidents of youth organizations that this is a service that's out there, but it's not just me pawning off that I'm a business and I'm looking to make money. I'm looking to help. And, it, you know, when you send out emails or phone calls, it kind of comes down to just kind of the somebody just reaching out and doing a sale. I'm not looking to do a pitch which helps, right? That elevator pitch helps, but the pitch is really actually to put this out there in front of you so that you're aware that this is important and it can help the athletes that you're helping. And it's there for you if you want it. But most of them seemingly at times just still don't want it. Um, So that patience is key. Um, And it's really still what I personally only do right now, other than for the past six months, I just finished recently my club volleyball coaching year um, that I've now been doing for 10 years, but I took a year off recently, but I've coached club girls volleyball for 10 years. Um, And most recently now doing this business and going to school for it and going to the point where I'm at now, I'm all in with this, but that's that side that I kind of have, right? So, you know, as Sean's a teacher and you guys might do some other things, I'm trying to go all in with the mental performance as best I possibly can and build a business that way. So the patience (laughs) is really, really, really important. And in terms of the um, how you're kind of focusing or concentrating on the work with an individual, be it if it's their multi-sport athletes, um, also I think a little bit to what Sean's point was is that eventually those conversations do develop into just a conversation, and it's with another human being and with a person first, which you kind of look to work with from the from the get-go. But it has to start with their sports a little bit, and a lot of that sport-related talk to get that hook. And to make them understand. But then, like for a softball player that I work with, right, eventually became conversations, almost just monthly check-ins eventually. They didn't want to do even just week to week 
But they were like, this helps to talk to someone about these things and then nothing else that like, came up and now we can have it back and forth and something might come up that kind of triggers something else that can help them in their next performance. But it doesn't have to be week to week. Now we're going imagery. Now we're going goal setting. Now we're doing this because it's kind of on that surface level. And now you've given them all those tools already if you've worked them for them for so long, depending on how long, right? And then it's like, well, now we can revisit it and we're not having to just break that down now. Now you've got it. And now let's see where and when we need to implement it. Yeah, you know, it's really two things to, to add to what you guys are saying, Zach. One of the things you talk about there is process. I, it takes me back to something that Brett McCabe said on his first episode. Uh, and it's from his book, Mindset Manifesto, where he's like, you know, process is not uh, created and then trusted automatically. Like it, it, it needs friction to become stronger. And so it's one of those things that you, you know, you create it, you apply it then you refine it and then it's applied again. It's this evolution of process. Like I think sometimes people think, well, now that I've created this behavior recipe or this process that needs to be taken care of, I can just go, I just trust it and just go after it. But it's a, it's an evolution. And that's where I think that patience is so critical. And then Sean, you brought up something uh, about that performance anxiety piece that a lot of your, your uh, clients or you know, kind of talk about, at least the, the first one that you had talked about, it reminded me of I saw a uh, clip. I think it might have been yesterday that Charlie uh, Tiger Woods was talking about Charlie, and they were talking. They were asking him, "Hey, where does he get this like confidence in this? Like, I mean, he's in front of thousands of people. He's like 13 years old. How does he get that?" He said, "You know what?" He said, it, "I taught him the same thing that my dad taught me, which is the shot is the shot. Whether you're in front of zero people or you're in front of thousands of people." The ball is still there. You're still hitting the club. It's still the shot. Like, as long as you're executing on that piece of it, it doesn't matter. Like, all of the other stuff is just noise as we talk about it. It's just things that are there. But if you can get yourself as a player to get to that point where, uh, and that's why I love so much about Dr. Mo, where he talks about, you know, the importance of commitment over, over confidence is, stay to whatever that is that you as a player, you as a, you know, business professional, when you're getting ready to uh, go and present in front of a large group of people or whatever, commit to what you're going to do and all of the confidence and, and worry about performance anxiety should go out the window a little bit because your focus now is on that one thing that you have to do. Go ahead. Yeah, John, I, I think the mindfulness component comes into that. Um, and the anchor. Yeah. Like we talk about the breath as an anchor when you're first kind of learning it, but then your process, your routine, that becomes your anchor. So whenever you're kind of being pulled away, you have that mechanism to bring yourself right back. Um, and that's a powerful, powerful tool. Um, I use it in teaching all the time when there's, you know, the chaos is going on. I've learned to be able to anchor myself and I may, my thoughts may be going over here. My attention's going this way and just the anchor brings me right back to where I want to be. Um, and that's slowed me down. I'm not as reactive, I'm not as emotional about things anymore. It's not so much the outcome. It's I controlled what I can control. I did yeah. what I could do. So that you mindfulness know- it, it, it is so true that anchor piece, because I, I think I mentioned this on the show a couple of episodes ago, but, uh, you know, I work with a one of the people I work with is a college baseball player. And I had a little bit of a breakthrough with him probably halfway through the season this year when we were talking about, you know, the on deck circle is really that time to focus on those things you can't control. It's the looking thinking about you know what pitches you might see during this a b what do he start you out with you know early in the game the situational hitting piece of it as far as what's the potential situations i might find myself in as far as runners on base and all of that and i told him i said that's where you kind of allow yourself to focus on all of that non-controllables right but once you step into that box that's when it should be all about the behavior recipes all about your thought keys all about the things that you're going to be able to control and give you the best chance if you can do this on a consistent basis for success and the aha moment for him though was if you do this 
if you start to do this and and create a habit of really being consistent with it, then the the most the times I think as an athlete that you're most um feeling good and confident is when you feel like you're in control. So now all of a sudden being at the at the plate becomes the something you're looking forward to. It's not something you dread anymore because if your mindset is that is the one place on this field that I can control everything about my performance, what I choose to swing at, how I'm executing the swing, all that stuff, then that's a really cool thing to be because now it's like there's not angst about, oh, it's my turn to hit or whatever. It's, oh, I get to hit. I get to go and be in that one place on this baseball diamond that I can be in most control. So I think those are all things that like is really an interesting piece of it is just seeing how these things kind of weave their way in and out, you know, um, but that's, that's a really cool thing. Have you guys found, uh, as you have done this now for, you know, a little while, um, and worked with all the athletes, speaking of kind of those common threads, Brandon, and I talk about all the time. Um, and for the listeners, you can't see my cool dance, like almost like a robot dance move as I'm like talking about these, uh, these weaving <laughs> in and out hand gestures here. But, uh, one of the things that I think is, <laughs> yeah. it might might have seemed cooler to me than it does to you, the the three of you that could actually see those uh but one of the things i'm curious about is have you found that there are certain pain points have there been surprises have there been things that you kind of went into this thinking like oh these will be the things that most people struggle with and then you were maybe surprised by it or just in general has there been those commonalities you find over athletes over athletes, as far as uh, most of them will, will start with you needing to work on X. Um, for me, I think it's been very much similar across the board when you kind of get down to it. Right. And then from the more to the youth perspective, you talk to the parents and they come out with what they think the kid is needs to work on or that they're noticing when they're watching them from the stands and then it sometimes tends to be slightly different from their viewpoint once you actually start talking to the child. Um, but they are mostly anxiety and stress and then emotional and or like and yeah, emotional management kind of like the two kind of the bigger things, I think. Right. So they're how can they manage the anger and frustration that they tend to see their kid have or the kid is having on the tennis court or the basketball court or on the field, because that's most of what I've been re recently talking a lot to kids about, at least to start. And then we can kind of go from there and figure out once we manage that, what else can help us once we've kind of got that down. But every week, sometimes the kid has come back and been like, I had a meltdown again at tennis or at whatever sport. They're like we worked on all of this. We talked about it for multiple weeks and you have all these tools and you've been trying them, but it still came about. So now that's why it's very difficult to, not necessarily break, but to work with it, right? That mindfulness piece is how you now accept it and with that intention and with groundedness and all those different things. And that we can get to later is that that old brain, new brain you kind of brought up at the very beginning is they don't necessarily understand how the brain and the mind works. And that foundation is so key, but it can get so scientifically jargon that it's difficult, even more difficult for them to understand. But if you don't start there, I think with many, which I think I'm trying to get to, now that I've learned more about it and think more about it, that that's where it needs to start to help them manage the emotions, figure out the anger and the frustration and understand that all of this, again, though, is not terrible to have, but it's working with it, right? Not just setting it aside or trying to forget about it or not have it because that's just super difficult. But that's what they need to realize because everyone thinks there's the fix, right? They're kind of coming right. to me like, he's very angry and frustrated. I don't want him to be angry and frustrated anymore what can you do or like work with them for a couple of weeks? And then I give, well, I don't know if it's really working. Can you give him some more homework or things to do? I think he needs this. We're like, yeah, well then he still needs to be the one to do it. Sure. And he might be 12, but it's not going to happen overnight. Even though you came to someone paid some money and had these sessions, this might happen for them when they're 15, because they're going to think back on the things that they've learned, but it's going to take a little bit more time than just like click of the button. But it's very, again, very similar. I think things across the board from, the ages too. I mean, it really just comes down to very few things, but there's so many tools that we can have that other things can maybe come out 
or they're like secondary pieces when you kind of break down the barriers. Um, but yeah, I think it's very similar. Do you have to remind them, Zach, that even with all your training, they're still having to either ride to or from the event with said parent? And maybe some of the anxiety and anger and all that is being created by the parent. I mean, is that a that 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 can't be an easy conversation to have, right? It it's not. And I and most of the conversations actually I try to keep to the athlete that I'm working with. And unless there's feedback conversations built in with the parents that they're looking for, can talk about that. But I'm usually get to a point where I'm comfortable enough with my athletes to talk to them about the fact that that is probably a pain point for them, right? And you kind of bring it up and be like, what about that car ride home? And they start bringing these things up. And then you have to be the one now to advocate for yourself and be like, hey, I really don't want to talk about this right now. And if I do want to talk about it, I will come to you and let them sit in that silent car ride until maybe they're like, you know, boiling up based on their performance and they decide to bring something up. But if you just kind of attack them right away and you're basing it from a standpoint of, the fact that maybe you pay money every week for them to do this and you come to these games and you sit for eight hours through their whole entire tournament or their, whatever they're doing, and you're thinking that you're not getting what you think that you deserve out of it for them because you're making it about yourself, then they're not able to work things out that they're trying to work out. Um, but I think it's definitely a piece of it. And, and then some things come out where like, you know, a kid is telling you that they took away my electronics because I had a meltdown or they told me if I have a meltdown, I can't go to another, lo- another location or this like vacation training thing that I've get to go to. Sometimes they're just going to take it away. And then you're just talking about how a parent's parenting and I can't get involved with that, but you're kind of like, well, this is now where our, our motivation, our external internal motivators, that's just not going to help you at all. Right. You're really just mad about that. And you're just so frustrated that you're willing to just be like, telling me that you know, she took away your iPad and your different things. And you're like, well, that did that stop you from having a meltdown? And like one week, they'll kind of be like, yes. So all the work we're kind of doing just kind of goes out the window because they're realizing that if they just don't have a meltdown, they get their video games back. So that's not going to help 10 years down the line when they're a division one volleyball player, you know, and they're don't care about whether or not someone takes away their video games. They're, you know, they're, they're having to now handle it at that point. And now what do they do about it? Because they maybe haven't worked with somebody, but I kind of think it sometimes comes to that. It's definitely difficult to manage. Yeah. When I work with high school athletes, I always have the parent in the first call, Mm. in the first meeting, um, because that's when I go over, we just have a checklist what can I control and what can I not control? I do the, you know, your parents, can you control your parents? And even the parents go through and kind of what they can control, like playing time, Mm -hmm. you know, they don't coaches decide playing time, not the parents, not the players, that's coaches. And having the parents in there and go through that process with them. I have had parents come up to me and say, I realize I'm getting angry over something I'm not can I have no control over and then I'm projecting it out and then my kids picking it up and that conversation on the way home is a lot more difficult than it should be because we're all our attention's going to what we don't control. Um so I I've had some good feedback from parent. Um you know, I did have one parent say, you know, you kind of ticked me off with that. And and being a teacher, I get told that all the time. So <laughs> you're used to that. <laughs> it was okay. <laughs> what's that? What's, what's, what's new? Right. Well, look, I mean, you you brought up teaching, and I, I'm really interested in this, Sean. Is that I as I listen to these things, I can't help but think that you know, as you guys are describing these players of those young age, it's just young age in general, right? I mean, these are things we're talking about. The same pain points for that athlete is the same ones that you're dealing with in your classroom at at the high school. I mean, it's not like you're dealing with like all of a sudden they just flip a switch and are this really calm, cool, and collected individual when they walk into the classroom. Uh, I mean, have you seen 
any of the things, because I know you were doing some stuff with those uh, school age, you know, your your students as well. Have you seen that continuing to be a, a difference maker as it relates to how they can apply some of these things into this, the classroom setting? Yeah, we I work a lot on attention because yeah. they're, you know, with, with cell phones, their attention spans are constantly being pulled at. And we talk about where's your attention right now? So that's, that's one thing that definitely comes up. Um, we, I've even implemented behavior recipes in, in class above the, above the line and below yeah. the line. Um, and I'll ask them, is this, I, they can be doing something and I, well, I'll go, is this behavior in line with what your, your goal is? And that's it. <laughs> and it's just that awareness. Um, and, and teaching them that awareness and allowing them to kind of see it on their own, not me pointing it out to them, not me saying, you know, put your phone away, put your phone away, put your phone. It's, is this helping you right now? Right. And as they get older, they start to understand that they do have a little bit more control over their phones. Um, I actually got to do a professional development where I taught teachers mindfulness for attention. And I did something with my students. I said, go on your phones right now. See how much time you were on your phones. And the average, I think it was like seven hours a day. And they were horrified by that. The students themselves were horrified by it. They were like, I'm addicted. I need help. Right. Then I had the teachers do the exact same thing. And the teachers were six and a half hours. <laughs> and I'm like, you're aware of it now. Now you can do something about it. So I think just using these skill sets, and you talked about anger and, you know, it's, it's not so much that they're good or bad. It's just be aware it's of awareness. It. Yeah. Yeah. Be aware. And once you become aware of behaviors, you can kind of change them. It is such a key element to what as mental performance coaches uh, or in, as teachers in general are so important is when you can help that person first take that step towards that self-awareness that whether that's a daily debrief, whether that's a weekly debrief, whatever the case may be, but just being cognizant of how are the things that I'm doing affecting the results that I'm having, you know, whether that's E plus R equals O or whatever the case may be. It's, uh, and by the way, Tyler Pazic is smiling somewhere when he heard that great question you asked them about how is this is it either helping you or hurting you? Because that's, uh, that ask better like questions, ask better questions. Yeah, for sure. Well, one of the things that I was really anxious to talk about with you two gentlemen tonight was, um, culture. And, and really, I think, you know, this is a topic I almost, hope that our listeners aren't kind of like rolling their eyes like here's Brandon and John talking about culture again <laughs> because it is something we love to talk about because I'm so fascinated with how influential one piece of a puzzle can be on the whole puzzle as a whole and 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 when you can really get it blended right and you watch as we start to let's take baseball and softball for example as you start to watch these college world series brackets start to unfold and you watch the regionals and super regionals in college baseball coming up over the next uh, few weeks, pay attention to those and you can see it. You great culture is on display. Like you can see it in a way that people, you know, if somebody's just moving a runner over and how they come out of the dugout and everybody's high, high five them and really up for that sacrificial moment that that player had, uh, or just the way that the camaraderie in general, the way that they do everything, they have a standard about them. And and it's no wonder why you see a lot of the same kind of teams that are up in those uh, higher ranks throughout the course of the year. And then uh, usually the same cast of characters, if you will, for the most part in the College World Series every year out in Omaha is because they've created great culture. But one of the things uh, I was really interested in talking to you guys about is what are you thinking is from an NIL standpoint? This is such a big topic right now, but I can't help but think, guys, as I'm watching the, uh, you know, kind of seasons unfold where we first started getting an NIL last year and we're starting to see it again this year, is it? I think from a mental performance standpoint, it does two things. One, it really impacts that identity 
that we talk about all the time because now this player is really torn between themselves as player or their their uh, selves as product, right? And then the other thing is how the culture gets impacted because of the fact that you've got some players that are making more money than other players. And it's hard enough to get people to understand their roles on on sports teams, much less now you throw money into the mix. So what what are you guys been thinking about that? Um, I think it has had an immense impact, like you said, I think on both sides. And the difficulty is the split down the middle or maybe a little bit to one side or a little bit to the other that these now um, kids for lack of a better word, right? They're 18, 17, 18 years old, some of them going into college, and then they're in the college ranks for however many years, or maybe it's only one year now or two years, that they are having to make so many of these decisions based upon what money they could be achieving and getting for spending X amount of time in school playing their sport. But some of them are then know that they're definitely getting to that next level. Some of them are playing and getting some of these NIL deals that are just on the smaller side of things within their community that they're there and probably not going to even get to the next level. And then what piece of it is driving their academics and what they're doing in the future? Because they, like you said, on that one team can be even down to some of the schools, maybe one superstar that's on social media, that's getting all this attention and drives a little bit of it to your school and to your program. But then there's somebody else on that team that possibly doesn't handle that attention very well. And their performance might be deteriorating or having difficulty with, and they don't have the help that some of us are trying to put forth to them, but they don't have the help where they now have to seek the help because this one person is in this program getting all of this that's happening And then they happen to be maybe in the backgrounds of some of these social media posts or the backgrounds of what else is going on in these discussions or in pictures that they wouldn't naturally be in. And now their whole experience has also changed. And then again, that one part, that one person, are they chasing or they are they going after all these things for the money to help maybe themselves and or their family members right here, right now? And that's a really main reason why they're doing it. And obviously they can care less about anybody else's opinions in the outside world about what they do with their time or are they doing it because they're looking for that attention and they need that dopamine dump all the time. And it just so happens that they're really, really great at basketball or softball or baseball. And now they have opportunities. Other people don't, if that kind of makes sense to everybody, you know, I think it just makes it really, really hard. Um, so. Yeah. Sean. Um, in talking to the college athletes, most of them aren't making, you know, more than pizza money mm-hmm. as, as far as the, the NIL. And there, there's been some organizations that have, have taken advantage of kids, um, with their, you know, posts on social media, you get this, but you don't get this unless this many people come in and mention you. So, um, you know, for those athletes, it's, 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 um, I'd say it's hard, you know, cause if they have, especially if you're, you're talking about some of the bigger sports like basketball and football, where you literally have millionaires on the staff and, and on the team. And I can't even say the staff, you have players making way more than their coaches at the college level, not the professional level. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that, that definitely affects culture. Um, you know, I, I think it's got to be very difficult for coaches to run their programs when the best interest of the team may not necessarily be what your top players are looking at. You know, they they might be looking at selling stuff as opposed to being part of this unit to win something. Um, I think everyone likes to say that they want to win a championship, but those championship teams, John, that you talk about, part of that is you, you got to sacrifice a little bit. And, yep. and I, I think, I don't, I don't know if that 17 or 18 year old is going to be able to say, you know what? I would, 
I'll get off doing my social media post at 10 o'clock so I can get a good night's sleep for my game tomorrow. You know, would they stay on and do more and more posts to make more and more money? And then their performance the next day is, is harmed. And how do you hold them accountable for that? It's, it's, uh, it's, it's a, definitely a game changer in the NCAA. Um, and you, you saw for a while there, college coaches would go to the pros. Nick Saban, go to the pros, hate it. <laughs> like, mm-hmm. Just absolutely hated it and come back. I, yeah, I, I don't know how those coaches are going to deal. And the new coaches, you know, good luck to them because this, this is a tough place to navigate. Yeah, I think at one sorry one at one point does it become a little bit of exploitation of the athlete and the person, right? From more of the business standpoint of NCAA or N- of, of collegiate af- collegiate athletics altogether, um, because they can, like you said, make money off of some of these superstars that have become superstars in any way, shape, or form for whatever reason, um, or even down to those lower levels. Um, so they're exploiting these kids and having them come here and putting all this money out there to get them to come to their school to then make more money. So they kind of see them as money bags. Right? We're not seeing these some of these athletes as people anymore. Mm-hmm. So we're seeing them solely as athletes and are a bag of money. And the person side is completely out the window. And I think a huge point like you just made, Sean, about the social media aspect of it, because that's where so many of it seems to come from, that you brought up before that in the high school. You talk to from both the parents, from the teacher side and parents, right? And or the kids ask them how long they've been on their phones for. But now these college athletes are almost shackled to their phones in order to make them get the money that they are then being told that they will receive because of X, Y, and Z or that they have this sponsorship, but they have to be the ones constantly making those posts. And now their mental calories are being completely zapped because there's the requirement on top of everything else that they're doing to be maybe a division one athlete right, and lift and go to practice and then do their studying. But now they have to stay up making these posts and act like their world is this amazing thing. But more than likely, many of times we've, I think, read a lot about or we understand at least the four of us that a lot of those athletes are having some of the biggest problems. But on social media and on the outside world, everyone's like, oh, my God, this person's making all this money. And they have all these great social media posts and all these things that are happening around them. And nobody cares about the person that's behind that screen. And so where does it stop? Right? However long everyone was talking about that college athletes should be paid or these things are so different. They're basically professionals. And we came up with NIL. But was that the right way to go about it? I mean, we're here now, but was that the right distinct way to, to do it? I think. And I'm not sure. I, I don't know that I was ever one that was like, yeah, I get it. This division one specifically, I've gone to any number of the college games that have come to Madison Square Garden or come to Rutherford or come to these places and you're supporting and you're like, yeah, now I'm in this stadium or in this arena. There's these college kids that are 17 to 21 or 23, 24, whatever it is playing and I'm paying to see them. This this big money that's happening here. How are they being affected? Are they earning anything from it? Because now they're being put on display for it. But now we kind of said, okay, we're not going to directly pay them, but we're going to directly pay them for all this stuff that they're doing because they just do it anyways. But we're now forcing the issue, I think, and now we're making them be on their phones or making them do those things. I think I think it's really interesting from a mental performance standpoint, and I think it's a it's a topic that could actually probably have an episode or two about because I think you bring up a really good point, Zach, where. Um, from an exploitation standpoint, you know, that was the big argument for NIL, right? Hey man, like education isn't enough and all that. And I, and I can tell you like, I, I, and I don't, I don't want to speak for John, but I I know like for, for me personally, when we were at school, you know, the rule was you could not have a job that created any more. And I'm going to use the word wealth because I think that's actually what it, the term was create any more wealth for you above and beyond your scholarship, right? <laughs> Excuse me. So now what you've created is culturally, you've got a kid that could come in and I'm I'm pretty close to a couple of folks and I've seen 
both sides of this and, and where it works and where it doesn't. But, and I think it all goes back to the individual, but I've got friends whose kids were very, very well, they were blue checked in high school, right? Just because of, and really it didn't even start out because of athletic performance. It started out just because they were an early adopter of TikTok. And the next thing you know, they caught on fire on Instagram and da, 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 da. Well, he's coming in as a true freshman and, you know, you can't make money in high school, right? They can give you product, they can do some things, but they can't pay you. But then when you get to, and that's why you saw some guys opt out of their senior years in high school, just so they could make the money that could then set them up. But without going too far, because I do want to be respectful of everybody's time, I think the challenge is is multifaceted. One, um, it, is it exploitation? Yeah, probably. But I think that the NCAA and the schools are sleeping at night because they're going, yeah, well, it's not me. It's XYZ who's hiring them. Um, two, it is culturally creating a challenge because, again, as a former player, if you ever found out that an incoming freshman was getting more scholarship money than you, man, that that was going to be a problem because that dude's never even stepped on the field. So culturally, that became an issue. And then I think the third and probably the biggest thing that y'all both brought up is who are they now, right? Because we we hear people talk about all the time identity. Now, not only are they the football player, volleyball player, whatever player or performer, they're also this money revenue generator for themselves, the school, their advertisers, and their family. Man, at 17, 18, you want to talk about mentally not knowing who the hell you are and what is your identity? That is tough. And so, you know, these are those things where, in theory, you you hear about it, it goes out, but in practice, it has been very difficult. I I think that you will see this evolve. It, it can't help but to evolve because the portal has just become, right. um, it, it's become free agency because of NIL. And so, you know, one thing kind of detracts from the other. And then the next thing you know, they kind of get lumped together because you, 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 you cannot peel NIL off of the transfer portal right now. It is free agency. The every school that I know is 100% going out and bidding. And, and as a fan of a, of a team here in the Southeast, I mean, I've watched it. Oh, you're going to go talk to that guy. Oh, did you hear Miami's talking to him too? Oh, well, hell, we, you know, you're not going to pay as much as Miami. Or this, uh, it, it just, and at the, at, and, and again, you're talking about 18 to 21, 22. And then, you know, some cases now because of COVID years and stuff, you know, you've got some people that are 27, 28, but it, it's still, it, it, it creates all kinds of challenges that I don't think anybody was prepared for from a mental perspective. Well, and culturally, you think about, you know, how that starts to pull at the, I think the big thing, Brandon, you brought up is transfer portal is, it, you know, just as we talked about earlier, the idea that friction is needed to make that process stronger. Friction in that that kind of collective suffering, if you will, is needed to make that culture stronger. And when when, you know, that teammate of yours who was there this year isn't there next year, and maybe it's six or seven of those or aren't there anymore now all of a sudden that cohesiveness that unity that suffering together isn't there because the the group you suffered with in the fall they may not even be there in the spring and it may be a different group and so now as a as a coach you're having to deal with this the other thing i think uh and then we'll kind of move on to something else but uh, uh but the other thing i think about as it relates to uh brandon you talked about identity is you know one of the things that protected to some degree, even though I don't 
think they were that protected. Amateur athletes in the past was, you know, from the fans that would, uh, the village mentality where they're all like, you know, oh, this guy's horrible. I can't believe how bad that guy played during a game or whatever. And you'd always have every so often that one person would step up the voice of reason and say, guys, these are amateurs, right? Like, let's take it easy with the, this guy sucks and he costs us the game and all that. Well, now you've opened a door because now this guy's making three million. He's making more money in one year as a, as a college football player than I will make in my lifetime. And so now I have permission, if you will, to start criticizing him more. And you better be damned if it's social media and that guy missed that layup at the end of the game that cost my team, then I'm going to go in on him because of the fact that I feel I have permission, just like I do with the pro athletes. I have permission now. So again, you know, still developing young minds, still developing that awareness and that uh, under ability or that suit of armor, so to speak, to be able to let some of those things bounce off. There's pro athletes that can't let those things bounce off of, but it's really tough when you have that uh, person who is, you know, making some money and, and uh, now all of a sudden is getting criticized because they're, you know, kind of caught in the middle of it. And you see it happening right now with Archie Manning at Texas because, you know, everybody's aware of how much money he's making. He's got the name, the fame, and the money, the, uh, all three things there that well, – uh, you, you, you know, heard what – you saw what he said, right? He said he's not going to uh-uh. take a dime until he's a starter. Yeah. He said, I, I will not – I'm not going to do – Yeah. One, take one penny until I'm a starter. And if you're that business that is – that has agreed with Texas to – Say, hey, I'm the booster that's got some money. I'll, I'll give him an NIL. I'll do whatever it takes to, to be that alpha booster, whatever that you guys need with your program. If I'm putting up three million dollars, let's not, let's say it's not Archie. Let's say it's a running back or whatever. Why do I not have the right to now call the coach up and say, why isn't Sean O'Neill playing? I gave, I'm paying for him to be here three million dollars a year and you're not putting him in like what, what's the deal with that coach so it's literally blue chips right it's literally that movie like we're starting to get to that point now where uh i think it, when money gets involved expectations are raised and so then it becomes a big old thing so um guys just here in the last uh little bit of time um what's been you know i know the thing i've always appreciated about both of you guys is you're always kind of looking to evolve like where we are with the mental performance side of it you're following stuff on social media you're learning Sean's doing the mindfulness uh trainings and things so what has been on your radar recently as it relates to that kind of next thing you're kind of has piqued your interest um, Zach's taking a drink. I'll, I'll jump on this. <laughs> it's, it's, it's interesting. Um, I've gotten the opportunity to, to kind of be around some, um, mental performance coaches on the professional level. And they talk about the mental paradox, like how important it is, but generally coaches don't do anything about it. And, and there's lots of different reasons. And Zach and I are both um, in the same location and we, we've messaged each other back and forth about this where it's just like, you know, you go in and coaches are like, yes, I am, I am all, I, we are in. And then, all right, when do you want to start? We got no time. Yeah. <laughs> and, yeah. and I, I think for a while it was, it was frustrating. Um, but, I'm starting now to realize that, and, and this this comes from working with different people. You meet them where they are, and then you you kind of just go with it. And and they'll if you're doing a good job, they'll recognize the importance of it. Um, I had a, a coach today call me up. They have a playoff game. Um, I had talked to them before the season. You know, work and they. It just couldn't, it didn't happen. They have a playoff game today. And he called me up. He's like, listen, can you come in and talk to the team before the game? I'm like, so you want a total stranger to walk <laughs> into your locker room and explain something to them? For the state championship, please. Yeah. I, I go, I go. It's effective. Like that's, that's not mental performance. <laughs> like that's the opposite. Right. Like I'm going to be putting all these thoughts in their head that are going to be drawing their attention from what was working. So I, I think 
just moving forward with that, um, um, uh, you know, working with the college, the college athletes, um, and, and starting to work, you mentioned like Tyler, I got to work with him a couple of years ago and I'm starting to work with and learn from a lot of the, the ones that are in the collegiate and professional levels, um, which I think is amazingly valuable. And you, you were talking about the athletes suffering together. Um, it's the athletes learning together. Yeah. And, you know, they're not suffering, you know, they're, they're not a cancer patient. Yep. They're, they're learning together. It doesn't yep. feel good to learn right. all the time. Yeah. <laughs> but that, that's all, that's all part of it. That's the, yeah. the difficulty in handling the difficulty of it. For sure. Zach? Yeah. I think uh, what I've kind of taken that deep dive as we kind of talked about earlier and taking this kind of maybe all the way back to the first few minutes of all of our conversation together when Sean brought up mindfulness and kind of what he's been doing in that realm. Um, I keep asking him and I'm sure I'll respond again or I'll send him a message later asking him again what course he had taken because I'm still <laughs> super interested into doing it. Um, do I then have the money and the time, right? There's the time, but there's the monetary side too, um, to do that right now. To, but I'm sure there's so many other resources out there, obviously, as we know, to, to kind of learn that. But I think it's such a strong piece of it. And to that point, um, I have taken another deep dive, so to speak, into a book called um, Golf Beneath the Surface. Um, The New Science of Golf Psychology by Raymond Pryor. And it has opened my mind to such an immense level about the concept of the brain and the mind and how important that foundation is to anything mental performance that you're doing because the mental performance side and or the tools that a lot of us teach and talk about can tend to be very surface level. So it's kind of like you can just try this or work on this or use this or change your thought process or just, you know, talk to yourself differently and do all these different things. But if you don't understand how your brain works, then you can't physically put those into practice. And that something like mindfulness and or your habits and or your psychological framework is the underpinnings of all those other things that you possibly would be working on, which is why the mindfulness piece, we keep saying that it's this hot buzzworthy word now, but you kind of look back to the Chicago Bulls and what they do, what they did and all the people that worked with them in those times of Jordan and different teams that were happening back in the 90s and different things like that, that were using mindfulness and different things, right, that helped them achieve all these greatness that everyone sees on the surface level. But what were they doing behind the scenes? It wasn't necessarily even all the extra tools and imagery and different things. It was something as simple as mindfulness based on their acceptance, their um, groundedness. Right. And those types of things. So this idea kind of bring it all together is was the idea of the old brain and the new brain that um, John, you highlighted earlier that we talked about kind of in our messages before having this um, call was the old brain. Right. Being what was developed centuries ago before we were all here having these Zoom meetings. There were prehistoric times. Right. Um, That, you know, the old brain was faster, stronger and was designed for survival. We had to either survive, we had to live by either killing something or be killed or go find food and survive. And then it took tons and tons of time, centuries later, for another part of our brain to develop, which was considered the new brain in this book and maybe some other um, resources out there that was developed to kind of use conscious thought and decision making processes and the ability to override that old brain. And that psychological safety. So, you know, when emotional discomfort, mistakes and uncertainty come about, which inherently happens in sport, and we all they all deal with all the athletes we work with and us ourselves, and we want to cope with them, the old brain sees threats, right, sees and reacts accordingly with the fight, flight or freeze. Mm -hmm. Whereas the new brain, we can train with mental performance techniques and mental training, like mindfulness, to take that old brain offline and put the new brain online to consciously make that space and make a decision between what we need, what we're trying to pursue rather than what we're looking to run away from. Yeah. So that's been crazy for me. And there's tons of examples of that kind of within that book and that I've been thinking about more and more of, but in the, um, 
in the conscious thought of time. Um, you know, I'll kind of leave it at that, but no, it's all plasticity. Exactly right. No, that's exactly what I was thinking, Sean, is that these are things that, you know, and they come, they play a role because even something as simple for you listeners, you know, we've been talking about this application towards athletics, but even if you have a child who is consumed with social media, there's a lot of research behind old brain, new brain as it relates to social media and collecting likes and, and what happens when you, the new brain perceives the lack of likes on their posts and what the old brain then becomes, you know, in you talked Zach about fight or flight or freeze is it becomes, you know, maybe just sad or maybe angry or whatever the case may be. And it just builds. And it's, it's kind of finding that homeostasis, that balance between the two. Um, something I was reading about, you made me think about this, Sean, was uh, the nor- neuroplasticity is uh, neurofeedback and the impact in sports and how that's really becoming uh, some something that is been, I know it's been kind of from an Olympic uh, athlete standpoint, it was something that's been on the forefront uh, for a while now, but really working uh, from a neurofeedback standpoint that can improve your, there's some studies that were done that improves that attention and focus. It improves their, uh, emotional control, their ability to slow that cognitive decline, um, improve sleep. So a lot of really interesting research on all of these things. And I, I think from a listener standpoint, just to kind of put a bow on some of these things, you've heard mindfulness talked about a lot. You've heard, uh, us get into the culture piece. You heard early on us talking about some of the pain points that as mental performance coaches, Zach and Sean have been dealing with is everything when you hear ground in this is all about like, what can you do strategically system wide that will get you back to the present moment? It's all about, and that's why we've talked about breathing so much on the show is when you're focusing on that will get you in that present moment to where you can get back to where your feet are. So you can concentrate on making the next best decision, making sure that you are, uh, as Brian Kane would say, in the moment to win the moment. But it's all about, and that is, you know, doesn't just happen for athletes. It happens for that uh, business person who is getting ready to, you know, either give a big uh, presentation or they're just worried about that uh, one-on-one feedback discussion they're getting ready to have with one of their, uh, you know, direct reports. It's, just kind of focusing back on the breathing, getting yourself. That's a great way to what place to start. If you haven't got to the point where meditation's for you, if you haven't got to the point where you can work on some of these other imagery and other tactics as it relates to mindfulness, focus first and foremost on breathing. And just concentrate on that so that it can get you level set. Because as we've said before, when you have to concentrate on something your body does in a very automatic uh, way, it will at least get you less focus on some of the other things which are so important. So I I always, and listeners have heard me say this, but it's so true. When people ask me what my goal is as a mental performance coach, it's not to get people to think more positively. It's to get them to think less negatively. And if we can get that to be the thing that they're focused on, we're in good shape. So guys, can't thank you enough. I mean, as I suspected, this hour went by pretty quickly, um, but you guys are always so gracious with your time. Uh, you know, a couple of repeat, uh, I won't say offenders because it's a, it's always a, it's a very valuable, uh, experience for us. Um, but I think I, we're more appreciative that you're willing to put yourself through the torture again, uh, you know, and come back on the show. So we can't thank you enough for, for joining us and best of luck to you both and, yeah. uh, continue. You know, you can find them both on social media. Give out your, um, Twitter handles and Instagram where people can find you. Sean, why don't we start with you? Uh, you can find me on Twitter on one mental performance. If you do a quick search, you'll find me. Um, and John, I have to do it. Good luck to the Irish American Baseball Society. <laughs> yes. The Wolfhounds playing their first <laughs> game against NYPD on June 17th. Good luck, gentlemen. That's awesome. And if you're looking oh, for wow. a mental performance coach, he's will be there. And then Zach, where can people find you? You can find me on Instagram on acme, A-C-M-E dot mentality. 
Perfect. Well, guys, thank you very much. We will definitely be sharing this episode on both of those platforms. So if people are wanting to uh, take a listen, uh, they can, you know, they'll be, able, I guess that doesn't make sense though, right, Brandon? Because if they're listening and heard that, then they already found the link. So I don't know if it's probably. Yeah, we're, not gonna, to... we're not going to tackle that one tonight. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's very complicated. <laughs> My neuro, neuroplasticity ain't ready for that one. That's it. Yeah. <laughs> I've been a work in progress for 30 some years for Brandon, so I don't think I'm going to get, you know, it's the uh, friction, the friction of the it's, process. It's, yeah, yeah, both of us. So, yeah. <laughs> so, all right, guys. Well, thank you all so much. We'll talk with you soon. Thanks, thank guys. you, guys. Thanks, all guys. Right. Bye bye. Want to provide feedback or stay up to date with the show? Visit our Instagram page at Mental Advantage Podcast, or you can send us an email at podcast at mentaladvantage.net. To have John Cullen work with you or your team, please write to him at john.cullen at mentaladvantage.net. Thanks for listening to today's episode.